You're listening to the LaunchCast, your favorite podcast on the planet, brought to you by Launchpad 516 Studios with me, your host, George Andriopoulos. We're talking leadership, business, life, and growth right now as the countdown starts. It's like food for your ears. Launch sequence. Launch sequence activated. Launch sequence activated. Five, four, three, two, one. Woo! Hey, hey, everybody. Welcome to the launch cast. Episode 316, I got goosebumps onto my sweatshirt. You know what we got going on here. We are back for another episode. I am not in my studio today. I'm going to explain that in a minute. But we got an interview, like I promised you, and we're going to talk leadership. But first, it's the launch dad himself, George Andriopoulos, bringing you your favorite podcast on the planet, Leadership, Business, Life, Growth. Right now, as the beat drops. All right, we're working on our tech, guys. I am. I'm in a different setup here. I'm at my home studio, and I haven't used this in a number of months since we came back to the office and opened up the the Launchpad Five One Six Studios again. Uh, but here we are at the home the home studio, make and do. This is why I'm here today. So my son's having a, a little procedure tomorrow. Not a huge deal, uh, but we're home doing some prep today, and I wanted to spend that time with him. He's upstairs. He built a fort while he's drinking this like horrible, horrible, disgusting garbage uh, to prep for his uh, for his little procedure tomorrow. So we're gonna wish him well. Uh, the launch lad, as he calls himself. Um, but yeah, that's why we're home today. Uh, some cool stuff going on. We have one of our uh, our new podcasts, right, for under the Launchpad 516 Studios banner uh, is finally on board, and we're going to be launching a new episode within the next couple of weeks. Sounds like autism. So shout out to Josh Mursky and Dave Thompson, my boys uh, from the Nicholas Center and uh, Spectrum Designs. Uh, also, Dave Thompson, of course, my co-host on Over My Dad podcast. Uh, we are launching SLA, new episode coming within the next week or two. I'll have an exact date soon. We'll announce it on all our social media. Uh, Discriminology, another podcast coming to Launchpad 516 Studios, launching, I believe, March 21st is the date. Episode 1 of their new season drops and it is fire. I can't wait for you guys to join us on that. So thanks for supporting the new podcast production company and everything we do. Um, our, our listens have been insane. The spreading happiness podcast with John and Mark Cronin has been doing awesome. So I, I can't thank you guys enough for everything you do, but that's not what we're here to talk about. We're here to talk about some leadership here. Let me do the bio. Let me do the bio here before I bring my guest on screen. Our guest this week, David Dressler. His philosophy is simple. Happier at work is happier at home. And happier at home is happier at work. I can attest to this. I can't wait to talk about this with with David. He loves helping founders and execs thoughtfully scale their brands while also scaling their lives. Before launching Quiet Advisory, he co-founded and scaled Tender Greens, an L.A.-based purpose-driven, fast, casual restaurant group. Uh, he grew up from he grew it from inception to 30 restaurants and $100 million in revenue. In 2014, Condi Nast named him, named them one of the best restaurant chains in the world. In 2015, Forbes listed them among the 25 most innovative consumer brands. There is so much more to the bio. I'm going to put the rest of the bio in the show notes. I don't want to waste any more time. I'm going to bring them on screen. Well done. I get my tech going here. I miss my audio board that's in the office right now. I'm just going to say that. There he is. David, how are you, buddy? Hey, George. Great. <laughs> this Good is to awesome. Have you. Yeah, thank you, man. Good to have you here. Thank you for dealing with all our technical bullshit that we're going through today. <laughs> it it's is really fun to watch you do it. 
Yeah, yeah. Well, you, you saw the sausage being made, right? I just realized that we had our LaunchCast reboots logo instead of the LaunchCast one. This is all going to get fixed in post-production, so I'm sure you guys won't hear half of this, but it's good to know that this is what happens behind the scenes. Uh, so, David, thank you so much for joining us. I want to dive right in with the first question that we always ask of our guests. David, are you a leader? No, no doubt. Yeah, so um, talk to me about that. Talk to me about your definition of leadership. Sure. So... so um, I've always, always felt, felt like, like um, if, if, if not, not me, then who? And, and so, so I've had, had this sense of, well, I need to step, step up. But, but also, um, I think I'm a natural, natural teacher. And, and so leading an enterprise, leading an event, leading anything, is this is really about uh, stepping up and providing uh, direction and heart and context and giving people uh, a sense of uh, what they're going for. And... Um, when, uh, when when we create, create a, a, a business that we're going to lead, when I create a business I'm going to lead, I think, I think about the culture as being um, a series of reflection of intentions supported by action. And for me, it's like, okay, okay so what do we, we want to do here, and how are we going to be while we're doing it? And I want to be the example of that because I want to I want whatever I do to be an authentic uh, expression of who I am. Yeah, and, and I kind of see, I, I know uh, that one of the topics we're going to talk about today is workplace culture, uh, and that's something that's important to you. And I kind of see, based on your definition of leadership, that uh, culture is really everything. Talk to me a little bit about culture and how that, uh, how being a leader um, can build a, a workplace culture that is not only conducive to having a happy work life, but also a successful business. So... Um... We all, we all know that, that uh, people, people would rather work someplace, someplace that feels good than feels bad. bad. And um, I've worked, worked for a bunch, bunch of people that I uh, learned, learned a lot from, but mostly I learned what not to do. I worked, I worked in a lot of places where I wasn't valued. Um, and, then and then I worked for some amazing teachers who showed me uh, what, what it felt, felt like to be uh, valued and important. And, and, and also to make a contribution on a team that, that felt fun and alive and exciting. And that's, that's what I wanted for my company when I went out on my own, when I got, got courageous enough with my partners to jump, jump ship and go, go after it. And, and honestly, um, George, George we, we, we found, found ourselves like in over our heads, heads working, working super hard, 18, 18 hours a day, seven days a week. And we, and we had, had a lot, lot of young people, people from, uh, from from Venice High working on our, our initial team, and, and some, some of these kids didn't, didn't have dads, dads at home, some, some of them didn't have moms at home, some were raised by their by their grandparents, and they, they needed, as, as we found out, somebody to look up to, to. and it, it felt, felt really, really good. good. And sure, it was like, it was a pain, pain in the butt sometimes, sometimes. But, but but being being a dad before I was a dad, a dad having my own children, being a dad at work allowed me to. Uh, really, really sink, sink into the idea that being, being a boss, being a leader, it is kind of like being a parent. And we, we can teach them lessons, we can hold them accountable, we can give them a ton of love, and the more love we give them, the more they respond, the more they're loyal to feeling like a, like a family. And I don't, I don't, I don't espouse the idea that a company, a business is like a family, because I think it's hard to hold that level of accountability. On, on family members because there's that unconditional love, but that unconditional love is really, really important to a team performing at its highest. Yeah, well, so you touch on a few things that are so interesting. I want to get back to the whole uh, relationship as a dad and how that's uh, how that has had an effect on your leadership uh, skill set. Um, but I, I totally get where you're coming from there. For me, and we've talked about this on the show ad nauseum, my whole journey to uh, to where I am today and, and the rise and fall and rise again. Um, that rise again happened because there were certain aspects of being a leader, being a leader in my company, being a leader in the community that I had to learn from fatherhood. And, and taking that thoughtful approach to leadership for me was so important to the genesis of my process, right? Because my process years ago was so different than it is now. And there's a much more thoughtful approach now. There's a, a, a humanistic approach um, that wasn't there for me before. So I completely get where you come from, even though that boundary of you can't treat work like family because there are, there's a whole other uh, heap of problems that come with that. Um, but there is a... a 
a, a work family aspect of things that is is super important um, to to building a successful culture and and to building people. I love I love your definition of leadership because for me, um, I'll stand up, I'll do it. I'll that that's my definition of leadership. Just that person that's willing to raise their hand and say, "I'll do it. I'll help. I'll, I'll whatever." whatever it takes. So I, I think we're very much in line with that. Um, I, I want to go back a little bit and then I, I want to go back to the dad stuff later. Cause that's so important to me. Um, talk to me about how you got your start in hospitality. Sure. Um, my, my parents, parents uh, my, my parents, parents split up when I was three. Uh, I lived with, with my mom, um, as, as a little, little kid, kid my, my mom worked three, three jobs, jobs and when, when uh, summer happened, those three, three jobs, jobs didn't stop, stop because I was, I was out of school. school. So uh, my, my aunt and uncle had a hotel in the Adirondacks, and um, I, got I got on a Greyhound bus. I was seven. Uh, bus, bus driver's name was Buzz. He dropped me off three minutes, minutes away from the hotel, and, and I would go and spend my summers there helping out. And you know, I rent out the paddle boats and the canoes, and I pour coffee, and I carry suitcases, and I set up tea, and uh, you know, my days were spent doing, doing that stuff. stuff. And, and I also get, get to go water skiing, and I get to uh, go off on nature trails. And but, but you know, I I, 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 I worked, worked my summers, summers um, for, for for the family, and got, got money, money put in my savings account, account for it. And um, and, and so, so hospitality was those, those summers uh, spent helping, helping out. out. And um, while that wasn't, wasn't like going, going to summer camp, camp it, it was. Um, it was, it was early, early training, training in work ethic. ethic. It, it was early training in putting yourself, yourself forward for, for, to, to help out the, the people that were staying in the hotel. hotel. And, um, and, and I, I love my summers there, there to the extent, extent that, um, you know, know it's, it's easy, easy to hate having to work. But, but if, if I look back on it objectively, I learned a lot and I got, got to be in a beautiful, beautiful part of the world. And, um, and, and I, I got to run around when I wasn't, doing yeah love that um and so you know the, you start working summers in hospitality and then uh there's a whole time period between then and you going out on your own what did that look like so um i went, I went and got, got uh, schooled in switzerland, switzerland. Uh, i went, went to hospitality, hospitality management school, school in Lausanne. Lausanne. Uh, i got a degree there, there. and um there, there I had to do a series, series of internships, internships every, every six months. months. Um, one, one of them landed me out in California at Hyatt. I went, I went through their management training, training program, had a blast, blast. then uh, went, went back, back finished school, joined Four Seasons, worked, worked for Four Seasons Hotels, hotels really, really cut, cut my teeth there, was sort of the poster, poster child for career advancement. Uh, worked like seven cities in seven years, um, traveling all over the place with nothing in my fridge but, uh, you know, Six, six pack, pack of beer and some glasses <laughs> and mayonnaise for tuna, tuna fish sandwiches. Um, uh, built, built my career there, there but, but also started to feel that itch of uh, I don't think, think that I don't see anybody up the food chain that I not that, that I don't admire or respect, but that, that I want to I want to be that. Sure, I want to be that. Um, so, so it's so, so that itch started to percolated me and it grew and it grew and then I, I ended up uh, at Shutters on the Beach, which is a beautiful luxury hotel in Santa Monica, and I met my two partners there, and we were all within six months of age of each other, all feeling that same itch, and I think individually we wouldn't have the courage to jump, but collectively we started talking about the fact that it was time for us to take matters into our own hands, to go after our own destiny, and we started working on a plan, and, um, and we did it. We, um, we we worked uh, until it was, it was time to raise money. money. We developed a business plan. We, we got, got our ducks in a row, and then we went out and raised money. money. I, jumped I jumped ship. I uh, I left an executive role at that hotel to go and serve people at the pool at the Peninsula Hotel, which is a very fancy spot in Beverly Hills, uh, because that, that would give me a cash job where I could just barely pay my mortgage, sure. but I had. 16, 16 hours, hours a day returned to me to, to, uh, to raise, raise money for our project. project. It, took it took a lot longer than I thought, thought it was going to take. I thought I'd be there for the summer, and then I'd, you know, I'd go, go off on our merry way. Come, come the fall, it's getting cold at the pool. Uh, nobody's hanging out there. there. Ordering bottles of champagne. I transferred the diner. I was there for two years. And um, 
and, and it was a long slog, but we raised, raised the money and we opened, opened our first restaurant. restaurant. Yeah. Um, and it was, it was amazing. amazing. Yeah. So, so uh, in, in going into your own venture at that point, is that, did you build that same type of culture that, that you build now initially, or was that a, a, a process to kind of get to that point? Cause I know you, you build that special love based culture uh, at your company. Was that a thought initially or, or what did it take to get there? George, George I, you know, I told you, you had all these high school, high school students, students working, working for us. us. And, and so, so um, I think, I think just, just generally speaking, I'm a pretty, pretty heart-centered heart dude, and my partners were similar, and, um, and we, we wanted, wanted it to be a fun place. place. It was a pressure cooker on the spot. You know, in, 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 in restaurant, restaurant parlance, it's 1,700 square, square feet doing six million in revenue. It was a, it was a, 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 a barn, barn burner of a, of a, of a restaurant, and an intense, intense place to work, and so we needed it to, to, to be fun also. But what, what we, we found was that we fell in love with the people that we were working with, and they were falling in love with us too because we were more than just the, the people, people telling, telling them what to do. We, we cared for the fact that um, things, things weren't going well at home or that they were managing three different jobs. And, and in LA, that's not uncommon in food service to work, work an early morning shift, shift then, then bus across, across town, town to get to another one and then get to another one. one. And that's, that's hard. That's, that's a really, really hard life. So, so um, um, caring, caring for what, what happens to our, our team members when, when they're on our clock or when they're on somebody else's um, just, just seemed like, like the right, right way to be a natural, natural expression of who we are uh, as people. Love that. Love that. So in building that culture and running this business, you know, we, we all, uh, well, those of us who are entrepreneurs out there, which I, a lot of our listeners are, uh, we know the struggle and there's ups and downs in this whole process. Um, what was it like trying to maintain the, the culture and the, and the vibe that you had at your business through the ups and downs uh, across the years? I think, um, the, the, there's, there's no, no doubt, doubt that there's, there's uh, it's, it's a, it's a struggle. Uh, it's, it's easy, easy when things, things are going well and, and, and when it's challenging, like, like in, in 2008, we went through, you know, arguably a very, very significant, significant economic downturn. And, and, and we, we just loved the hell out of our people even more because whereas, whereas our restaurant, uh, our restaurants were booming because of our value proposition, proposition other, other places where they were working were cutting shifts. shifts. Yeah. And, and, and so, um, whether, whether it's uh, a new labor law that makes, makes it harder for business to, um, to to conduct, or um, whether it's just labor shortage, or whether it's business cycles, um, we just we always, always turn, turn to our people and say, how, how, "How can we work together to make, make this great? How can we how can we keep it special? What do you need?" And invariably, what we found is. Um, I, I go, go by, by the maximum. maximum. If you want, want to build a better room, ask the guy that sweeps the, the floor. floor. And, and so um, for us, we were always trying to make sure we touch base with the people that were actually doing the hard work to figure out how to do it together. And they gave us a lot of our answers. Yeah. Love that. Um, and answers you had. <laughs> uh, I, and I see that in your book, uh, 10 year plan, you and your co-founder, uh, Eric Oberholzer wrote the 10 year plan, uh, how the founders of 10 degree and scaled their heart centered brand. What made you after all this want to write a book? Um, two, two things. things. Um, in, 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 not, not in any particular order, order but, but, um, the, the first, first was to, to actually, actually sit down with Eric, Eric and relive really it. You know, you know, when, when, when you're, you're building, building a business, business it's, it's a breakneck break speed, it's intense. Um, we, we had tremendous success. We also had our fair share of hardships. We made our fair share of mistakes. Um, but, but to come back together a few years removed and look back at the story was an awesome experience, really cathartic for Eric and I to celebrate our wins, to lament some of our regrets, to reach out to some people, people we had talked to in a while, to feel into the fact that we created a $100 million business in, in, in an industry with a 95% failure rate, uh, that we grew in good times and bad, 
that we uh, did stuff that we've never done before. You know, there's no real manual for building a business. Sure. A lot of it's just uh, ready, ready, fire, aim. aim. And, and, and yeah, yeah, we managed, managed to do it. And so, and so it was a chance, chance for us to celebrate and to um, uh, take, take stock. stock. And, and then, then secondly, we, we had, had great mentors, mentors who, uh, as we like, like to say, could see around the corners uh, for us. And our, our story is, um, it's, it's a good, good solid story, story and we, we made a bunch of mistakes and it's, it's great, great to be able to share those honestly and openly uh, for our entrepreneurs, both in the food space as a gift, gift to them and, and in, in any, any industry where leaders, either founders, founders or execs want to build purpose-driven enterprise. That's, That's important, important to us to, to give, give something of, of value and use to people who are doing, doing what we did. did. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Um, <clears throat> I want to shift topics for a minute. I know we, we touched on this a little bit before. Um, been married for over 20 years, uh, two amazing kids. Um, what has marriage, what has fatherhood taught you about leadership, about life, about your business? I think one of the most important things is that... that um, um, I was a workaholic for sure. Uh, when I was in the hotel business, I put that before everything. And um, my wife, who was not my wife at the time, but my girlfriend, uh, finally came to me and said, you know, you're reminding a lot of my dad, who was also a workaholic. And um, I think if we don't get some help, I'm going to do the same thing that my mom did, and I don't want to do that. So unless you're willing to get some help around this, I'm not willing to stay, which, which was, for me, uh, in, in the beginning, beginning like, yeah, yeah, well, you don't understand what I'm up against, you don't understand the responsibilities that I have, and I'm trying to provide, I'm trying to build something. But after, after a couple months of therapy, therapy, I realized, wow, wow man, I don't, I don't have, have any hobbies, hobbies. I don't really have any friends, friends just take out. out. All I do is, is work, work in laundry, laundry, and that's not the life. So, so I owe it to her. Um, for, for setting, setting me straight, straight that there could be more to life, life and work. And, and, and then um, so that's that. And then that set me on a path of uh, spiritual learning, of tool crafting, of uh, best practice laying down to, to, to not only um, balance my own life, but, but to bring, bring that into the culture of, of our business. That we didn't want our, our chefs working more than 50 hours a week. We, we didn't, didn't want, want them to be working every night. We didn't want them to work every weekend. We didn't want them to miss every game and every fun activity that their kids were doing. We wanted them to have it all. So that that's one big piece. Um, I kind of came to parenting backwards, as they said, because I was I kind of saw my role as, as a boss, as kind of a parent. But you never know what it's like to be a dad until you're a dad. And, uh, and that just deepened my feeling of... of love, heart-centeredness, heart the ability to bring that to work, and also to kind of bring, bring the two places together. As you said earlier, George, like, there, there is no real dividing line in an authentic person between work and life. It all kind of comes together, and the best way that that comes together is as, like, a fully expressed individual, not one way at work and not one way at home, just kind of like this guy. And that feels really good. I love that. I love that. We, we talk about this on this show so much. So um, it's something that I call a balance phenomenon. Uh, and, and for me, oh man, you just, you put it so succinctly, <laughs> David. Uh, for me, when I figured my shit out um, was when that balance came into play. It's like, yeah, you're trying to be one person at home and, and one person at work and one person with your friends, one person in the community. And it's like, it's a lot. It's a lot to sort of juggle and uh, and shifting, and it causes this really like an identity crisis as a leader um, because you're constantly shifting and changing who you are. And for me, you know, I I had just a, a, a major fall in my life, and when I recovered from that and rebuilt and decided that I was going to focus on being a dad and build my life from there, and then work came back into play and building everything around it. Um, I don't know. There was this organic effort that was put in. It was just like, okay, maybe, th I guess this is finally George, you know, like this is who this guy is. And so 
it became very effortless to share that guy with everybody else. And so people knew who I was, my boundaries, my non-negotiables, my, um, you know, as I was building my business, like I, my priority was to, I was a divorced father of two. And my priority was to be the kid's class dad and, and coach and to go on every field trip and to be there every second of my kids' lives. And then work came into play. So if a meeting happened to come up during that time, nope, sorry, can't take it, you know, and, and work people started to realize that that was a boundary of mine and everybody at home realized. And it's sort of just my life built around that. And it created this balance where it was like, yeah, now all of a sudden expectations are there and people understand and, and, and everything builds around it. And you have this beautiful life where you're kind of like, oh shit, is this all it took? Like just to be honest with people about who I am and what I need and, and whatever. So I, I love that you said that. That was, it was truly like the, the definition of the balance phenomenon here. I love that. Um, we'll be right back after these quick words. This is John and Mark Cronin from John's Crazy Socks. And we're interrupting to say we hope you're enjoying this episode, but please make sure to check out our show, The Spreading Happiness Podcast, another great show produced by Launchpad 516 Studios. New episodes are available every week on all your favorite podcast platforms. Join us on our new podcast as we continue our mission, Spreading Happiness. Thank you, folks. You mentioned uh, 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 the food industry a lot and and limiting hours of chefs. Um, Let's talk for a minute about, because this is something that intrigues me. We've had a number of uh, chefs on this show as guests, and I have some close personal friends. We've had uh, Chef Allison Fasano on here. We've had Chef Mark Bynum. Uh, Both have done stuff on the Food Network, done all those shows. Um, We've had some major conversations surrounding mental health in the food industry. Um, and how difficult it is based on the culture, based on uh, what's needed of them as chefs, based on when they become entrepreneurs, how much their role shifts and the pressure on them. Can you talk about that a little bit and what you've seen? Sure. Um, can, can I, can can I, I tell, tell you one, one more thing, thing that you made, made me think, think of? Before yeah, of course. That? Yeah. You know, you know um, that, that whole, whole idea, idea of, of two, two distinct, distinct people, people. One at work work and one at home um, allows allows for uh, you you to deliver deliver your very best. best. We We deliver our very best of of one one half of ourselves at one place place. and the very very best of another side of us at the other place. But but inversely, inversely, they they never get the full benefit of us. Yeah. And And so so I I love that um, what what you said because what it does for me is, is, okay, I get to give the best of me Wherever, wherever I show, I show up, yeah, not, not just, just half of the best of me. Yeah, and then, then as, as for um, as, as for workplace uh, sanity and um, and, and sort of mental, mental health, health and, and, and that, uh, no, no doubt, doubt it's, it's a hard, hard business. business. Uh, it's, it's a hard, hard business for, for the reasons, reasons that I mentioned: the the, the long hours, the, the intense environment, the lack, lack of margin, margin that, that, that you know, makes, makes it so that, that you're always doing way, way more with way less. less. Uh, it's, it's a tough business. And, and so um, what, what I like, like to say is, is um, we, we have, have to have empathy. empathy. We have, we have to have a fierce, fierce amount of empathy for, for everybody that's on our team, team and for ourselves that is working on a hard business. And, and I think... Uh, COVID, COVID has probably, probably taught, taught other, other leaders, leaders who are listening or not in the food space, space that it's hard to be a leader, it's hard to be in business, there's just so, so much going at us, us. We're, we're, we're pretty fragile. fragile. Yeah. And, and so, so, one, lead with empathy. empathy. Uh, two, ask, ask a lot of questions and stay connected. And, 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 and three, um, give. give. Give in a way that allows uh, people, people to feel like uh, they're, they're cared for. for. Um, because, because sometimes, sometimes all, all a person needs is somebody to talk to, talk to for a second. second. We, we get, get so busy, busy 
um, we get, get so, so busy and wrapped up in getting to the next place or just, just getting, getting through the week or dealing with the staffing shortages that we're, we're running past, past each other. And we, we need to be able to look into each other's eyes and say, hey, dude, what's, what's going on with you? Because you seem to have lost your sparkle. How can I help? What's, what's happening for you right now? And sometimes that's all they need. You know, they got a sick kid at home. They haven't been giving their best to their marriage. They mom's in the hospital. Who the hell knows what's going on? Yeah. But there's typically an answer, and it's one of two things. Either something's going on at life that's weighing them down, and they need something around that, or something has changed at work, and they don't know how to tell you. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, it's, it's incredibly insightful and thoughtful to operate a business like that, and it's it's tough. Uh, that, that's not the easiest thing to do. And, and entrepreneurs out there should know that it's, it's not so formulaic to be able to jump in a business and be as enlightened as, as David is right now. I mean, it comes with trial and error. Uh, it comes with making mistakes. I mean, I know for me, you know, I've been, I'm, I'm educated in a formal way, but my biggest education came from all my failures in, in business and in life. Uh, in general, and it taught me how to be a more thoughtful person. It taught me how to share my experiences with others, and then that was the key to my leadership in in particular. And that all leaders are are different and operate in a different way. But um, it's like we said in the bio, you know, happy uh, if you're happy at work, you're happy at life. If you're happy at life, you're happy at work. Uh, and and people that can create those kind of environments, if you are able to, if you have the resources to, um, your culture is going to be. Great. So I, I love everything you bring to the table, man. Um, before we start wrapping up, just a couple more questions and then we'll move on to the big three. Uh, so, you know, you built this incredible brand, uh, but you did eventually walk away and, and, and move on. What was the reasoning behind uh, walking away? So um, I, I built, built this, this brand, brand and loved about every minute of it. You know, you know, objectively, objectively speaking, speaking, looking, looking back, back. Um, there's, there's a point, point at which the business started to get really big. We were 50 people at the home office, 1,700 team members. We had hired, I had replaced myself out of my own job a number of times to professionalize the C-suite, so to speak. Yep. Um, and so when I hired our CEO to replace me, um, you know, I was, I was magnanimous, magnanimous about, about it. Now I'm going to just devote myself to culture and she's going to take the reins and she's going to run the company. And I even I gave her my office and I said, go ahead. And then I loved the person I hired as, as my replacement. And so um, I did that. And then I started seeing her do her job, which was having meetings with my team in my office with the door closed. And, and there were glass, glass windows, windows and a glass, glass door, door, and I could see it all happening, but I wasn't invited. <laughs> and, and that was hard, and um, harder than, than I thought it was going to be. And uh, and, I and I talked to her about it, and she she did something that was uh, this is Danielle Bruno. She she did something really great. She gave me an amazing gift, which was this. She said, "I could never have done what you did." I could, I could never have built, built this, this business from scratch. And, and what I'm, I'm doing now is my skill set. set. It yeah. is my expertise, taking, taking it from where you created it to, to, to the, the level that you took it to take it to the next level. So, so let, let me do it and then enjoy whatever, whatever you want to do. Yeah. And, and so, so that was that. that. Um, and, and so, so that, that got, got me thinking, thinking and, and, and released me from the sense of obligation that I had to protecting the culture at all costs because what I came to realize was that there was a deep enough bench of culture ambassadors, people who really, really imbibed it, really grokked it, really understood and, and felt the culture that I had worked so hard to create with my partners that um, they had it. And so that let me know, okay, then, then what? And what, what I thought about, about was what, what is the best part, part of my job now? The thing, thing that I most love doing, what I most love doing is talking about stuff like this and helping 
people will get, get unstuck from the place they're at. Yeah. And, and so um, I, I now work with uh, founders and executives who have achieved a certain level of success, are starting to feel like the wheels are shaking a little bit, who are not quite ready to professionalize, but who are self-aware enough to know that they need a sounding board, they need a partner, they need somebody who, uh, who they can run stuff by, uh, who's, who's not, not their board of directors, directors, who maybe uh, has the ability to see around the corners, like, like I said earlier, and who they can, can have as a, a helpful guide on the side. So, so I set up an advisory practice and I do that. And I also do leadership coaching, holistic leadership coaching for, for founders and executives. Love that. Love that. Before we move on to the big three, and we'll share all the links in the show notes, guys, to uh, quietadvisory.com, uh, bios on um, on David, and uh, some more fun stuff that you could find. Um, I said that we have a lot of entrepreneurs that listen to our show. That's primarily our audience is uh, mostly made up of, of entrepreneurs. What advice do you have for entrepreneurs and executives who want to lead purpose-driven uh, enterprises. Uh, and I want to, before you answer, I want to say that um, purpose driven is what you make of it, right? Um, when I started my company, Launchpad 516, which is an advisory company, right? We're, we're a management consulting firm. Um, but it was about, I knew what I was good at. And I knew my skill set as a corporate turnaround artist and somebody that can go into a broken business and fix it. Um, but that was just this skill that I was bringing in. When we gained like a, modic a modicum of success and, and started um, becoming bigger and having more resources, I knew that this would be empty with this whole shift in my life if I didn't have purpose behind it. And so developing that purpose, that mission statement for us, which was really to provide organizations and individuals with the tools and resources to thrive and succeed, that mission became, I don't know, just this purpose that really drove this side of me that was not activated when I was younger and, and dumber, right? It was this thing of like, I had a, a greater purpose as a leader, a servant leader out there where I could help people through this business. Yes, I am making money, of course. That, that's the whole point of this thing. I can't sustain it if I'm not making money, but if I have purpose behind what I do for a living and I can make that money so that I could sustain that and help more people while creating a life for my family, that's purpose. So I, I just, before you answer that, I just wanted to give people that definition because a lot of times people overthink things, especially some of the concepts on this show. You know, they think of leadership as this big grandiose thing when it's as easy as offering a, a helping hand to somebody, raising your hand and, uh, and saying that you'll do something. Purpose-driven businesses can be just as simple uh, as long as that purpose is to help somebody out there in, in some way, shape or form. Um, it doesn't mean you, don't, you have to do it for free. It's a business. We get it. Uh, so I'm sorry. So uh, back to you again. What advice do you have for entrepreneurs and executives who want to lead purpose driven enterprises? Well, I think you, you nailed it. Um, first, first is figure out who you, you want, want to help. help who you, you can take, take on the ride, ride with you. And, um, and, and, the, and the hint that, that I would give, give to founders or business executives, executives who want a purpose-driven enterprise is take as, as many people on the ride with you as possible. possible. That's, That's the, 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 the more people, people that are impacted positively by what you do, the higher the, the purpose. And, and so that's, that's one. Two, two is have, have a plan. plan. Um, you know, we, we, we called, called our, our book 10-Year Plan. Year plan. Uh, that, that was not just the name of our book, book but it was the name of our company, TYP Restaurant, Restaurant Group. We started, started in 2004 when we incorporated the company, company calling it TYP. TYP. That, that was a commitment that we were making to each other as founders, as co-founders, co uh, to stand, stand for something for 10 years, years to plant, plant the flag, flag and to go. go. Um, so, so develop a plan. plan. Develop the 10-year vision for the company because it, well, it seems like a long time, particularly in today's fast business mentality, it goes by in a heartbeat. And so having a plan that is uh, driven by, um, by values is really, really important. You said they say uh, culture strategy for lunch, but I believe that um, 
a strategy seeped in culture based in values really wins the day. They're both things that are equally important. That's that. And then surround yourself by really smart people. Don't do it alone. There's people like you, George, people like me who uh, have taken the arrows and we can help. And uh, we know that young entrepreneurs don't know everything. And they know as their business grows, as you go from being a chef to being a restaurant owner, things change. As you go from being a restaurant owner to an owner of five restaurants, things change. The whole skill set is constantly morphing. Get the help that you need. Ask a lot of questions. Don't be ashamed to, 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 um, to get help. Awesome. Very cool. Very cool. Let's move on to the big three, guys. The big three from the launch cast. The big three. We're going to throw out just a couple of fun little little questions here for you, David. I want your three quick, concise answers for each one. Ready? I'm ready. ready. All right. Three favorite restaurants in the world. I got to start here. Tender greens. <laughs> got to say it. Of course. <laughs> <laughs> Um, um, right, right now, now I, I did in Taifung, Taifung uh, uh, dumpling place that I love to go with my kids. kids. And then, uh, third, um, Nama, uh, Nama, Nama Vietnamese. Okay. All right. Gotcha. Uh, next one, three, this will be a little bit tougher, I think, but three biggest failures in business that you've had. I should well, say three failures or mistakes. One was uh, when, when I, was I was an executive in the in the, in the hotel, hotel business. I was, I was in the same place that I was, I was talking about earlier around getting, getting help. I was uh, overwhelmed, underinspired, and, and I needed help, and I didn't ask for it. So, so whereas, whereas I, I don't, I don't hate, hate the outcome because the, the outcome forced me to move into, into my own. Power and, and start my own business. I think I could have. I think I could have done, done that a little bit differently if I had gotten some help. Uh, second failure was um, uh, not, not trusting, trusting my gut. I mean, we, we talk about this in the book, but not trusting my gut when it was uh, time to move east and, and open restaurants in New York. We couldn't. We couldn't, we couldn't really make it pencil out. out. Uh, our partners really wanted us to be bold and, and open in New York, and we should have trusted our guy. It wasn't the right time or the right move, and we didn't handle it the way we should have. That's probably the second biggest failure. Um, and then the third was... Um, um, you know, uh, as things, as things uh, grew and as... Um, as I brought in my CEO replacement, there were times I think I should have spoke up more and I got a little quiet. I wanted to trust that things were happening the way they were supposed to. Um, and I probably knew in my gut that I could have been a little bit more um, expressive, bold, opinionated about things as I let it go. Sure. Okay. Um, three favorite things about fatherhood. Oh, wow. Um, one, one is, is just watching them do, do life and, and just sitting back and watching them figure stuff out. That's, uh, that's, that's amazing. Two is uh, cuddles, like, like just uh, <laughs> happens this morning yeah. where we were all in bed together. It's the best. And then um, um, I, think I think third is, is um, when, when they, they triumph. triumph to just be in such total awe of their magnificence or whatever that word is, that they, you know, they just, they're their own people. They're amazing spirits. They're amazingly capable and naturally creative, resourceful and whole, and they've got it. And sometimes the best thing that I can do is just, just it's crazy, sit right? back. And, it's yeah, crazy. crazy. How, how old are you two? Five, five and nine. nine. Five and nine, yeah. So uh, it, it's funny. I have a, a, a 13 and an 11-year-old, uh, and now I have an, 
a 19 month old and a, and a new one coming in, in May for my second marriage. Um, it's crazy when, as they're growing up, uh, this is my, my oldest is my daughter, Mia. Uh, she's 13. She'll be 14, uh, in two months. Um, you know, you see, you see these kids struggle with the same stuff you might've struggled with when you were younger. Uh, and, and it's, it's heartbreaking because you go, Oh man, I remember going through this and she, she's like the same person. And, you know, and then you worry about them, the future and and meanwhile, they're little kids, right? And you're like, what? It's silly to worry about their futures and their success and everything like that. And then you have a moment where uh, I was thinking about this the other day. It was International Women's Day, and I was doing a post on social media. And uh, I look at my, my my oldest now, who has got a starring role in her in her school play. And we just went to her uh, guidance meeting for scheduling her her ninth grade, her high school schedule, which is insane. And and it's like humanities and honors classes and entrepreneurship and theater and you kind of look back and you're like wow like i can't believe she got to this place she's gonna be just fine you know that that's an amazing feeling watching those wins and accomplishments i i'm i'm right with you there i'm right with you there Um, i'm a mush for my kids by the way in case you didn't notice (laughs) um all right you know what let's end it there that was enough of the big three uh david pleasure having you guys uh, we'll put the links in the show notes, quietadvisory.com. Check this company out. Uh, very different advisory firm. Very, very different, uh, 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 I guess, um, man, I'm having a brain fart here. Uh, <laughs> very, I'm going to have to really clean this episode up. A uh, very different approach uh, to how they handle clients and, and businesses. So check out quietadvisory.com. 10-year uh, plan by David Dressler and Eric Oberholzer. Uh, I just bought it on Amazon two ways. I got the paperback, which I had to pay for, but on my Kindle Unlimited, I also got that. I like having both because I want my options. Um, maybe I'll even get it on my Audible account because I have 12 credits that are expiring soon. Um, but 10 year plan how the founders of 10 Degree and Scaled Their Heart Centered Brand. Can't wait to read that. Normally, I would read this before the interview, but life happens, right? So, David Dressler, thank you so much for being here. I appreciate you very much. George, George, this is super fun. fun. Thank you very much for having me. Awesome. Guys, uh, catch us every single Monday, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, iHeartRadio, Pandora, uh, Amazon, Google, all the places you know the deal. We'll see you next time, guys. The LaunchCast is brought to you by Launchpad 516 Studios, produced by Fabrizio Fugazi and executive produced by George Andriopoulos. Marketing and PR by Media Convergence. Theme song by Tommy Lungberg. Music and sound effects are licensed through Epidemic Sound. The LaunchCast is hosted with Podbean. Make sure to subscribe to this feed wherever podcasts are available and leave us a five-star review on Apple Podcasts while you're at it, guys. You can find the show on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, iHeartRadio, Pandora, TuneIn, Amazon Music, Google Podcasts, Podbean, and everywhere else that podcasts are available. Follow me, George Andriopoulos, the host at Launchpad CEO on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram, or follow the show at The Launchcast Show on Facebook and Instagram, or at Launchcast Show on Twitter. Visit our website, thelaunchcast.com, and make sure to follow all the great podcasts produced by Launchpad 516 Studios. We'll see you next time, guys.